Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of IRL Horror. I'm your host, Buexo, and today we have a horrifying case that has stuck with me since I was a kid. There is that one case for everyone at some point in your life that makes you stop and pay attention. It makes you aware that truly horrible things happen to people because of other people. It makes you cautious, concerned, and even mindful of danger and of other cases. It's the one that sticks with you. This is that case for me. When I was young, a girl just a year younger than myself, and not too far from where I lived, vanished from walking her friend home in broad daylight in the middle of busy, bustling Toronto, Ontario. Her name is Holly Jones. She was born September 14, 1992, to Maria Jones and George Stonehouse. She was youngest of four. I've seen a few reports that talk about how her and her mother had a special and strong relationship. I absolutely believe that from what I've seen. It looks like Holly was and still is very much loved. Holly has been described as cheerful, well-liked, a good student, and energetic, but gentle. She played sports like basketball and ran cross country. She had big dreams and loved to sing and wanted that to be her career when she grew up. Unfortunately, that dream, that chance, was taken from her. On May 12, 2003, at only 10 years old, she vanished from her neighborhood. She had wanted to show a little more independence and walked her friend Claudia home after they hung out for a bit. Claudia made it home, but Holly did not. Police quickly launched an Amber Alert and began searching, suspecting something had happened to her. The search was short-lived when the next day, a man walking his dog found a bag with part of her body in it. Shortly after, another one was discovered with more. They had been dumped in the Toronto Harbor and washed ashore the next day. Now, this was heartbreakingly taking place as the family was pleading on media for the safe return of Holly. The search for her quickly turned into the search for her killer, someone who had assaulted and dismembered this innocent girl and attempted to weigh the bags down so they wouldn't be found. The man who found her was taken in for questioning. The detective stated that he didn't think this man was involved at all, but that they really had nothing, and they obviously needed to make sure. He was cleared after being interrogated. The issue was the police had no idea who could have done this, clearing her family early on. Often, we see crimes being committed by people that know one another, at least in some regard. In this case, there was nothing, and the pressure was on. Police were able to find DNA and green carpet fibers on or with the remains. They also assumed from the weights that whoever did this was likely in decent shape, but that's not a whole lot to go on when there's nothing and no one to compare it to. What do you do when the only evidence that could put someone away for committing a crime is DNA and there are zero leads? Police attempt to identify two men that had been on a Toronto ferry around the time her body would have been dumped. One man comes forward, but the other is never identified. The man that did come forward was cleared. It's always so scary when someone goes missing especially a child, and under the circumstances Holly did. To then quickly find out she's already dead in such a brutal manner, with nothing pointing to anyone. The community was in a panic, parents terrified, calling in anything and everything that looked suspicious. Everyone was on high alert. The unimaginable was happening, 
right next door, in our own yards even, in the middle of the day. Parents were understandably scared and everyone was heartbroken. The police had up to 300 people working on this case at a time. There was a big increase in police presence in the area and around the schools in particular because there was a rash of attempted abductions and other tips being called in at this time. With the abductions happening, Holly missing and murdered, and the police presence, the kids and parents were nervous. Social workers were called in to help with these anxieties and grief. It really was an entire community on overdrive. So what more could the police do? They had to do something. Interestingly enough, the police luckily made the bold and controversial choice to DNA test males in the area on a voluntary basis. They went door to door, not only asking for a swab for DNA, but also using their observation skills. That, as it turns out, would be the break they needed. Michael Briere, a 35-year-old software developer, lived right in the middle of all of this commotion. One day, the police knock on his door. Their first impression is of an incredibly clean home, the smell of cleaner reaching the outside of this home that he rents. Briere answers the door but refuses the DNA sample, which was his right as it was voluntary. But upon answering his door, the police also noticed green carpet and the weights that looked as though they would match what was found with her remains. This all put him smack dab on their radar and police surveillance was put on him. Luckily, during the surveillance, Breer discarded a can of pop he was drinking and from that, police were able to test his DNA. And wouldn't you believe it, the man who wouldn't let them test his DNA and scrubbed down his whole place and had green carpet, was a match. They had their killer, and he lived just blocks away from Holly's home, but he had no prior connection to her. Breer was arrested and put into protective custody. So what exactly did happen to her, and why? Now, this is all horrific and terrifying, and so incredibly heartbreaking but the motivation behind it all is even more terrifying. According to Breer, he had been heavily drinking the day Holly was abducted, assaulted, and murdered. He had been watching disgusting, criminal, inappropriate videos with children in them and decided that he was going to play out this fantasy of his and that he was going to grab the first young girl he saw. Apparently, no preference, just any young girl. Unfortunately, Holly happened to be that girl. He also stated that had Holly screamed when he grabbed her on the street, he would have let her go. Now, I'm not sure how true that is, but we know that brave Holly did put up a fight. He did assault and murder her. He thought she was dead and put her in the fridge, but realized when he heard some banging that she was, in fact, still alive and attempting to escape. Because of this, he strangled and dismembered her. Now, we know what he did with her body. He put her in bags and took her on public transit and dumped her. Apparently, had the current not been the way it was at the time, her body might not have been found. It may not have washed up onto the island, but rather gone out further. So really, had things not happened the way they did, he would have gotten away with murder. What police didn't know was that there was more to be discovered. Apparently, while investigating, Breer was close, as we know, it's why he was asked to supply a DNA sample, but he was close enough that he was able to try and nervously keep an eye on the police, because he had put out remaining cleanup into the garbage bins, and the day it was garbage day, there was a strong police presence. So, when they had no clue who he was, he was watching them. Breer did plead guilty. He apologized for his actions, but really, is there any kind of adequate apology for those actions? No, not at all. From his confession and from the events that transpired, it seems as though this was all done on a whim in the moment. It sounds more like he was sorry that he was caught rather than sorry that he did it. Otherwise, why do everything he did afterwards? If his actions were inspired by the disgusting videos of children he was watching, why did he escalate it? Why did he murder her and try to hide it? 
That just doesn't add up for me. While the attack itself didn't last very long, I believe it was about an hour after she was grabbed, she was already dead, but that's plenty of time to think twice. Not only that, but he said had she screamed, he would have let her go. So I don't know, but none of it seems genuine to me, and I don't think it usually is in any of these cases. Really, had he been sorry, he could have strode right out of his door and walked up to an officer and told them he did it. He was sentenced to an automatic life sentence for first-degree murder in 2004. He is currently in Kingston Penitentiary and will be eligible for parole in 25 years, which will be 2028. After his arrest and during the investigation, they have noted that watching these types of videos that inspired him to go and commit this crime was something that he did do normally. This wasn't something new for him. Um, they found child pornography on, I believe, his home computer and also stuff at work. I'm not sure exactly where they found it, but it was obvious that this is something he did. That really was quite the escalation to go from watching something like that, even regularly, to in the span of an hour, not only grabbing a random child off the street and assaulting them, but then murdering them. It's, it's a steep climb. And it does make me wonder, was there anything done prior to this? Now, I do want to say kudos to the police in this situation. From all accounts I've seen, they handled this case well. And it was their bold and controversial idea to swab for DNA voluntarily and keep their eyes open that blew this case wide open. I've also heard that the family liaison officer for the Jones family was incredible, so I'm glad to be able to say that at the very least. To this day, Holly's memory lives on here in Toronto. And those of us who hoped for the best, her family, that loves her, and her friends. Growing up during all of this, I can say that her death had a big impact on life here. Parents woke up. They realized that the world is a dangerous place. Not that crime didn't happen before this, but there's often something big that happens that gets people's attention and scares them more. And enough for change. From my perspective, things got more tight, more strict in what kids could do on their own after this. Before this, I was very much like Holly, although I believe this was the first time Holly was allowed to walk by herself, so really this wasn't even normal for her to do so. Perhaps it was the area I grew up in, which was not a good area by any stretch of the imagination, but it was certainly the attitude in the area. I used to walk to school by myself, go down the street to the corner store, go play in the park beside my building and in the ravine on my own. Same with all the other kids around. It was just what we did. But there was a definite change in mindset after this, I think. It likely would have gradually happened anyways, but this was certainly around the time that I noticed it. I wanted to add that in there because, well, one, there shouldn't be any backlash, zero backlash towards the parents here. That's just how things were. And really, you should be able to walk down the street and not have anything happen to you like that at all, ever, at any age. This was also a route that Holly used to take. It was the route she used to take to school. The actions are solely the responsibility of the guilty party, and the blame is entirely on him. And two, it certainly impacted life here in Toronto, and that's important to point out. There were memorials made for Holly. I believe there are a couple murals, and her mother maintained a garden as well. Last I saw, and I couldn't find anything more on this since, but one of the murals was to be taken down because of development in the area in 2019. I'm unsure if they actually took it down, but it was set to be. After her death, her mom was trying to get a bill put into place called Holly's Law. Again, I'm not sure if it did go through. The information on it is super scarce, but I was able to find a Facebook page for Holly's Law Canada, and they do help raise awareness and support for kids who have been or may be sexually assaulted. It looks as though they focus on making sure kids are informed about their body, consent, how to avoid or talk about inappropriate situations, and things of that nature. 
which is very admirable. And I'm so happy that they've turned something so, so, so horrible into something that may help someone else because that's not something anyone or any kid should have to go through. If you're a parent and listening to this, hug those kiddos a little tighter tonight and please make sure you talk to them about consent, inappropriate touching or behavior, road safety, street stuff, and let them know that they can come to you with anything. Honestly, I have no more words for this case, for the actions that took place here. They're just, they're no, they're just no. It's so wrong, so horrible. To Holly's family, especially her mother Maria, I'm so sorry that you had to go through all of that. The loss you've suffered is unimaginable. And I know there is nothing anyone can say, even all these years later, to make it okay. Holly is someone I didn't know, but her memory has stayed with me for almost 20 years now. I hope that there is some comfort, however small, that she still lives on through memory and through your efforts to help educate other children. And with that, I will leave you all until next time. Stay spooky, and please, stay safe. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.